Okay, we're going to go through a multi-step procedure <clears throat> on how to calculate capacitance given the geometry of the two conductors that make up the capacitor. As an example, we're going to use the parallel plate capacitor, which is the most common type that's used in actual circuits, and by the end of this we'll understand why that is so. So this consists of two thin sheets of metal that are relatively close to each other. So in perspective, it looks like this. And the distance between the two sheets is D. And the area of one of the sheets is A. And we're going to assume that the two sheets are identical. We are also going to assume that the length of the sheets the lateral size of this, which is of order the square root of A, that that's much bigger than the separation between the sheets. In a side view, it would look like this. I have a top sheet of metal, like so, and a bottom sheet, like so, and I'm showing a finite thickness of the metal for the top and the bottom. So the question is, what's the capacitance of this configuration? And we can use this same multi-step procedure to calculate capacitance of virtually any geometry of two pieces of metal that make up a capacitor. The first step is we're going to apply equal and opposite charges, plus and minus Q, to the two sides of the capacitor. So I'm going to apply plus Q on the top side and minus Q on the bottom side. Now I'd like you to think on your own, given that these two plates are made out of metal, how will these charges arrange themselves on the two plates? So pause the video, think about that on your own, and when you think you have an answer, go ahead and unpause. Okay, so the charges are going to be attracted to each other, so they're going to get as close to each other as they can. So that means that the charge on the top plate will be on the bottom surface, like this, and the charge on the bottom plate will be on the top surface, like so. We can think about the electric field due to each of the two sheets of charge. So the electric field due to the bottom sheet at some point here we're treating it as an infinite sheet of charge because of this condition that we're assuming the two plates are quite close to each other. So as long as we're not close to the edges, we can treat this like an infinite sheet of charge. And so the field due to the bottom sheet, the minus charge, would point downwards towards the bottom and it would have magnitude sigma over 2 epsilon naught, where sigma is equal to the charge Q divided by the area A. Similarly, the electric field due to the top plate, the, sh the sheet of charge on the top plate, it points away from positive charges, so it will also point downward, and it's going to have the same magnitude, sigma over 2 epsilon naught, because it has the same charge per unit area, sigma. So the total field, if I add these two together, the total will be twice as much as either of these by themselves. So E total will be sigma over epsilon naught, as we know it must be because this is a point that's close to a metal surface, and we have this expression for sigma over epsilon naught for the total electric field due to everything close to a metal surface. All right. So I was getting ahead of myself slightly because I actually just did step two, which is find the resulting electric field. So we just figured that out. The resulting electric field that came from applying the plus and minus Q is just sigma over epsilon naught, or sigma is Q over A. Step three is we're going to use that electric field to find the difference in voltage V between the two conductors. 
So remember, V is a shorthand for the difference in voltage between the two conductors, in this case, the top plate and the bottom plate. So we're going to use the equation delta VAB, the difference in voltage between any two points, is minus the integral from A to B of E dotted into dr. Now, in order to apply this equation, I have to first choose two points, and I have to choose a path between them. So I'm going to choose a point here, point A, which is on the upper plate, and here's point B on the lower plate, and I'm going to choose a path that goes straight down from point A to point B. Now, in this case, the electric field is parallel to my path at every point along the path. So that allows me to deal with this dot product quite easily. Remember that in any vector calculus situation, you've got to deal with the vector nature of the integram before you attempt to integrate. So in our case, E dot dr can be simplified because E is parallel to dr at every point. So E dot dr for our path simply equals E times dr. Then in this case, so then delta VAB is minus the integral from A to B of E times dr. And in this particular case, we have the electric field is constant over this whole distance, as long as we're not too close to the edges. At the edges, the electric field might, might not be uniform, but because of this condition that we're assuming that they're close together, we approximate them as infinite sheets. So the electric field is constant along this path from point A to point B, so I can take it out of the integral. E constant along path. So that means that delta VAB is minus E times the integral from A to B of dr. The integral from A to B of dr is just the path length, which is the distance between the sheets. So this is minus E times D for this particular case. So then we're going to plug in for our electric field is sigma over epsilon naught and sigma is Q over A. So delta VAB is equal to minus sigma over epsilon naught, that's E times D, which is equal to minus Q over A <coughs> times uh, 1 over epsilon naught times d. So that's the voltage that we just found. Now, it's quite difficult to get the signs correct when we're thinking about the voltage. And so we are now going to say, um, for we could call this maybe step 3b, that the voltage difference that we're going to use to calculate the capacitance, I'm just going to define that to be the absolute value of delta VAB, so I don't have to worry about whether I got the sign on this correct. So in our case, that will simply be Q over A epsilon naught D. The reason I'm justified in doing that is because in step four, I'm going to use the definition of capacitance, that the capacitance is defined to be the charge divided by the voltage. And when we write this equation, we mean for both the charge and the voltage to be positive numbers. So plugging in in this case, this will be Q for the numerator. And then in the denominator, I have Q over A epsilon naught D. And I can cancel the factors of Q on top and the bottom. And so this is A epsilon naught divided by D. So that's... Um, actually an important result in its own right that the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is equal to A epsilon naught divided by D. That's such an important equation that we'll go ahead and give that two stars. We can see from this that 
you can make a large capacitance, you can get a large capacitance, either by making the area large or by making the separation between the plates small. And um, in real life, you do both of those things, but in terms of making the capacitor in an inexpensive way, you focus on making the separation between the plates as small as you can. So you can see that the virtue of the parallel plate capacitor is I can get a large capacitance simply by decreasing the spacing between the two capacitor plates. And so in real life, when they make a, a parallel plate capacitor, they have these two sheets of metal with a layer of plastic in between them. And in another video, we'll talk about the, the role of the, the layer of plastic. But the, so there's a layer of plastic in between them. And by making that plastic very thin, they can make D quite small, and that gives you a large capacitor for a relatively low cost.